But Walti was a, sort of the center of the campus. Uh, I don't mean geographically, but of campus activity because uh, all the administrative offices were there, the president's office, the provost's office, the uh, vice president for student affairs had his office there. So it was a, really a center of activities. It was a classic college building. Student development office were all on the main floor along with the registrar's office. And at the very top was what they called the museum. Van Ralsey Hall dominated the central part of the campus. It was, of course, uh, just to the east of the chapel and on the southern edge of the pine grove. It was a massive, impressive building, uh, interesting style, made of red brick. We had a lot of classes in there at that time and uh, the, so, the uh, humanities and some of the social science classes is primarily met in that building, as I recall. So it, it was quite, a, quite an interesting building, a combination of purposes that it served. Vinvaldi was, a, I think it had been built about, uh, in the, about 1900 somewhere around there. And it was a, a, a very t typical kind of public building. It, so it was a, if you came in the front door, you could go down half a floor to the basement and up half a floor. Because of the age of the building, it was wood. And so I remember wide stairways, creaky stairways. Um, that you'd climb up and down. Of course, there were no elevators or anything. And classes, as I recall, were held on the main, main floor, second and third floors. And then a, the fourth floor had storage. The old museum was up there. Once in a while, I think we would sneak up there. And uh, I remember a lot of uh, stuffed animals and other artifacts. You know, there was an orangutan there uh, that somebody had somehow brought back from the Indies. Uh, one of the student pranks and orangutan got removed from that museum and hung from the rafters in the chapel. So when everyone came to chapel the next morning, they had great fun. <laughs> so it had its air of mystery, you know, in the upper reaches, but it was very much where a lot of important classes took place. And I do remember that. I do remember sitting in classes there and being entranced by what the professor was saying. When I was in Van Ralty, I mean, some of the offices, my, my office was on the second floor. There was a basement, and that used to be where the, quote, Kletz was. Um, there were classrooms on the first and second floor, a lot of offices. Some people on the third floor, their offices were really scary. And nobody had a private office. Even in my office, there were, it was a, a little area with, with some walls that were put up, uh, like cubicles almost, and there were at least four people who had offices there. But I do remember that there was a, the classroom that was next to my office one afternoon when I was uh, working there the year before the English department moved out. There was a sociology professor, Ruth Van Campen, who's still a really good uh, friend. She was teaching a class in there and I heard this huge noise and basically the ceiling had collapsed or at least a good portion of it. And she was able to get all of her class out in time, and I think, and I could be wrong, that we still continued to have classes in that building until the end of the semester, but without using that room. And I may be wrong, maybe they fixed something up. But it was a dangerous building at that point. Van Raldi Hall had been at the subject of the conversation for many, many years, what to do with it. Uh, uh, but there were other building projects that, that really took you know, higher priority at that time. So it was no longer being used uh, as a classroom building, just again, for safety, for safety reasons. And 
the only uh, occupants of the building uh, were the administration and then at the lower level, the, the Kletz and the, um, the bookstore. So there had been a lot of conversation as to what to do, but there were other priorities that uh, uh, building projects that uh, you know, took to the, the forefront. Uh, so the fire really caused the college, forced the college to, to make some decisions as to what to do. Uh, so in, in some sense, uh, the building was not what you would say architecturally superior. Or it wasn't like the chapel, for example, where you would say that this is a stunning building. No, it was, it was a very useful, uh, classic old administration. If you've been on other campuses, they usually have a main hall, which is a, an administrative center or whatever. And that's what this was. But was it, uh, is it something that they would preserve? Uh, probably not. We went through a preservation of the uh, uh, Graves Hall, for example, which was a classic building. It was stone and it was uh, worthy of preservation. But if someone were to come to the college and say, we think we really ought to preserve Van Ralty Hall, I don't think you would have had many takers. So it was a loss, yes. But from an architectural point of view, uh, I would guess not a huge, huge loss. I remember that there was a stairwell going right through the center of the building, so the students would always be ascending and descending those very creaky stairs. I remember that very well. Uh, on the third floor were offices, professors' offices, and so as you were ascending the stairs, you would look up and you would sometimes see them, you know, kind of standing around in an almost statuesque way, and you could gaze up at them from, you know, your lowly distance as a student. Uh, I don't remember it being terribly well kept or up to date. As I said, the stairs were very rickety. There was a story that once Professor G. Ivan Dykstra, who was our philosopher, um, was lecturing, and the window was open. It must have been a spring day, and uh, a pigeon flew in and just perched on the windowsill. I wasn't there, but the story was that without missing a beat, uh, Dr. Dykstra went up and just picked up the pigeon and in a very dignified way, threw it out the window, so it flew away. So that was one of the little endearing tales, you know, about Ben Ralty. <laughs> in Detroit, ready to board a plane to Atlanta, and the guy taking your tickets said, I don't think you're going to be needing this ticket. He said, you need to call your office. And I had not heard anything, I hadn't listened to radio or television about this fire which had been raging for quite a while, and I just came upon it. One of my students who worked uh, at, a local, at a local factory on the third shift actually called me on the phone and uh, said, Mr. Renner, Van Ralty Hall is on fire. So I uh, quickly uh, got dressed and, uh, and headed to, to Holland and to the Hope campus. And of course, uh, when I arrived, uh, the, the entire building was aflame. building was totally engulfed and there was just really a shell of brick that was left. Van Ralty Hall was an old, old building uh, built in the early 1900s and it was a uh, wooden interior, wooden floors, wooden staircase and it went up like a torch. I was absolutely stunned, A, because this is the building where I had taught until the English department had just moved into Lubbers Hall. The building was in horrendous shape, and we realized why we, were, we had been moved out of it. And we were surprised that it was still allowed to stand without being totally renovated. But all I, 
one of the things I remember is later that day, when I was checking my watch to make sure I was going to be on class in class on time, my watch had stopped at the exact moment that I had passed by the fire. The flames were everywhere. I mean, this was not just some little fire. It turned out to be um, uh, an, an all-day situation for the fire department, for uh, the campus, uh, uh, as the uh, fire smoldered throughout, you know, throughout the day. Everything from all the stories of the building came and just went right down into the basement. That's what we had to deal with. And actually at the end of the day, it was decided that uh, uh, some demolition already should begin by knocking down the walls of the building just to make it safer uh, for, the, uh, for the firemen to, uh, to, go out, to go in and put out, the, uh, put out the last of the flames. The fire did start in the basement in the area of the bookstore. And there were a lot of flammable uh, materials that were, were stored in that area. So uh, whatever would have caused the, the fire to start was quickly fueled uh, you know, by, by those materials and became just like a chimney flue and uh, just quickly spread uh, you know, throughout the building. Everybody was really worried because Van Ralte was only feet away from Dimnit Chapel, that the chapel would go next and I think the firefighters probably were training the hoses on that part of Van Ralte so that this would not spread. And when they realized they weren't going to save the Van Ralte Hall itself, um, they began spraying their water on the chapel to keep it cool and uh, they were successful in that of course. We were fortunate at that as well as not any wind that morning so that they were able to contain the flames and there was no damage to any other building uh, uh, from the fire. But obviously you just stood there like for the next hour and a half, eventually you got closer to some other people but you couldn't get too close to the fire and everyone just astounded. This, it's one of those things that happens somewhere else. And so it was just a total surprise. As president, I often had many things on my mind and quite often I'd wake up about 4 a.m. and start thinking and but then after thinking of them for a while, I wanted to get back to sleep, so I'd go down to the kitchen and make some warm Ovaltine, and 15 minutes later to go to bed, and I almost always would sleep soundly until I had to get up at 6.30. Uh, so uh, that happened to me on that uh, morning of the Van Walty fire. I had gotten up about four o'clock, and I recall looking out the window toward Van Walty, and everything looked so peaceful and quiet. But then I was sound asleep and the fire started about 5 a.m. And uh, I was sound asleep at the time, even though it was only 50 yards at the most away. And uh, th then finally I woke up because the phone was ringing about 6 o'clock or 6.30. And, uh, and so as I woke up, and we were in the second floor bedroom and had a window which faced directly toward Van Rolte. And then I could, even through the curtains, I could see the, the light of the flames. And I looked out the window and here's a fire engine, even between Monralty and, and our home, uh, pouring water on it. And so that was my introduction to it. And uh, so I went down and let the public safety man in. And uh, then a, a very exciting day of my life began. We had a, uh, a president, Gordon Van Weilen, who was a commander of a submarine, so he took charge. And everybody had responsibilities, everybody knew what was going on, everybody knew what the protocol was to be. So there wasn't chaos. It was just a, a major catastrophe, but the recovery was orderly and done well. 
and uh, a lot of good people contributed to that. President uh, Van Wylen at the time um, brought together the staff that afternoon already and um, uh, assignments were, were made as to tasks as well as where we were going to be located because the you know the entire administration basically was located in in Venralti and all of our belongings of course our desks the files our personal things uh, were, were basically destroyed so it was a matter of kind of getting past the shock of the event but then realizing that we were just days away uh, from commencement from the end of the school year so there was a lot you know a lot to be done when I did wake up about uh, 6 o'clock or 6.30, immediately, you know, you, 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 as the president, you feel you're responsible for this and I mean, to manage it well. You know, how, how do we cope with this? And, and, and uh, a lot of thoughts go through your mind. Uh, one is what's happening to all the records in this building. And uh, that turned out to... Uh, to, to be uh, not quite as, quite as uh, catastrophic as we thought because even though it's a very uh, intense fire, uh, when papers are packed tightly in a file cabinet, uh, they get seared around the edge, but they never actually burn. So there were many more things saved and the whole process by which we salvage these documents is a, a story in itself. I had, a, I believe, five or six different people reporting to me. And we, had, we worked together as a team. Every Monday afternoon at, at four o'clock, we'd meet. My real role was of leadership and uh, giving everybody confidence and hope for the future. Uh, one of my tasks uh, as director of public relations was to communicate the word uh, throughout uh, the Holland area, through Western Michigan, and to our alumni body, just exactly what had happened and then what uh, was going to be happening uh, in the days ahead leading up to the end of the school year. The first response was everyone was just so glad nobody was in this at the time. Yes, the building had been ruined, but no lives had been lost. Uh, people were still in a state of shock, I mean, for, for weeks after that, and then uh, these are all the records of Hope College were in this building. And that's why they had to finally move all of that stuff to DeWitt Center, which was supposedly the student center, gradually got more and more taken over by administration. And of course, everything was totally drenched. Luckily, a lot of things were in file cabinets, which of course had to be cooled down. I think papers had to be taken out, spread out, thawed. Um, this is long before computer records, and they were able to salvage quite a lot. I mean, just file cabinets don't burn that easily. The work uh, was ahead of us after, after the fire. Um, the, effort to retrieve materials uh, from file cabinets uh, began almost immediately because uh, you know, we were advised by experts that uh, the big threat to those sorts of materials uh, which would get wet from the firemen's hoses and things was mildew. So uh, work really almost around the clock to retrieve materials and then we loaded them into uh, freezer trucks and they were taken to a local warehouse where the, all of these wet files and pictures from the alumni office files and, and the sort were all frozen. We had tried a very small freeze-dry chamber locally. It was just a small thing. It would take forever to do it. Then arrangements were made in, in the coming days to ship all these frozen materials to a company that specialized uh, in restoration uh, of burned materials. And what they did basically is they uh, put them into, uh, into warehousing that would draw, would draw the water out of the, the material. So our records were just, you know, within a week, we had them back. We then received from this company 
truckloads of, of dried materials. So we set out in uh, what was then Carnegie uh, Scout and Gymnasium and set out on tables all of these uh, different materials and decisions were made what to keep, what not to keep, what to photocopy. Um, so it was really a month-long project. I was able to provide uh, summer employment to a lot of, uh, a lot of students who uh, just really helped us uh, to get back on our feet. It uh, was really amazing, given the intensity of that fire, the things that uh, could be recovered. In my office alone, we had uh, 14 four-drawer files, not, not uh, in any way fire protected, that contained student records. Not the transcripts, but student records that <clears throat> when we uncovered them were just total ash inside. There's nothing left. The transcripts themselves were in fire protected f uh, files. But in those days, a transcript was made with a piece of lightweight, uh, really, cardboard, and you put uh, adhesive stickers on it by semester. Well, with all that heat, all of those, those uh, adhesive stickers just sank to the bottom of the file. So <clears throat> to try to retrieve all of that stuff was just horrendous. And uh, most of that stuff we actually didn't go back and retrieve because it just was not retrievable. But when they pulled those fire protected files out of the fire, when they would open the drawers, fire would come out. That's how hot it was. The um, drying process made a lot of them very, very fragile. And the, the goal was to try to, to rescue as many papers as possible and uh, some inventive um, ingenious people decided the good way to do that. They literally got some um, uh, pancake spatulas or flippers and uh, were able to, to use it to slide between, uh, between sheets of paper. And uh, in doing that, um, uh, then we were able to either photocopy them or actually uh, uh, save the sheets of paper. This was 35 years ago and a lot of the college record keeping functions you know, had not yet converted, uh, you know, to what we now uh, enjoy uh, through, you know, through computers and, uh, and, and the like. So a lot of student records, for example, were still, uh, uh, the transcripts of grades were all kept uh, on paper. Uh, we were fortunate there where our registrar, um, John Huskin, uh, through a microfilming process, had uh, all of those records stored off campus. When I came to the college, there wasn't a stick of microfilm available anywhere uh, to protect the records. So I wrote a proposal and we got the records uh, microfilmed. And that really saved us. So within three days, we were back up and running and producing transcripts. The, the fire became a national story. It was picked up by the Chronicle of Higher Education, picked up by certainly by the local media, but also national media. And you always have shysters out there. And the registrar's office would get lots of calls, they still do today, to verify degrees and all of that stuff. So there were a few enterprising people who thought it would really be nice to claim a HOPE degree when they didn't have one. So to their surprise, we were back up and running. And uh, so we uncovered a few shysters in the process. And uh, there was one, one individual in particular who tried it three times, so three different companies. And I finally said to the human resource people over at that company, I said, would you give me his address and telephone number? Because I would really like to just send him a note. So they did. So I sent this person a note and I said, this is the third time now you've tried to claim a Hope College degree and just for your information, you don't have one. And secondly, we do have your record that when you were here for, for part, part of your college career. So please don't, don't do this again. 
because uh, you're, you've been found out. There were some smiles on students' faces thinking all oh, my grades have all burned up. <laughs> but uh, the, the truth of the matter is that the, the college did have all of those records uh, thanks to the, the foresight uh, of the registrar. So many stories developed about how this had happened. Uh, one that I think we all found kind of preposterous was that somebody had left a coffee maker on and that the coffee maker had burned dry and then you know, flames had spread. That was not too convincing. Later on, and of course I've never heard any follow-up on this, um, the rumors started that it had been a case of arson, which made it more, of course, more sensational and more interesting. Perhaps this had been a deranged individual who was just fascin fascinated by fire and decided to try it out on, you know, a big opponent like Van Raldi Hall. Uh, you think, sometimes think that as time passes, you'll get a clue of this, but no, no, no real reliable clue. Uh, and we couldn't think of anybody who might have a, a grudge against the, the college. There was one uh, maintenance person who was working and had some recollection of seeing somebody uh, at that time around the outside of Vinralti, but uh, we never were able to come close to really identifying uh, even the cause, let alone who might have done it. There was always a lot of speculation. The fire started in a workroom that had uh, some duplicating machines that used some kind of accelerant and that whole business. So there was some talk at one time about arson. Uh, I don't think anybody ever pursued that or, or nothing really came of that. But there was some talk at the time that perhaps it was, there may have been some arson involved, but it's really hard to say. Uh, there were two people, uh, I was one who smoked a pipe and, and fortunately we were out of town. I mean, the, the fire started early, early morning. So uh, they couldn't blame our pipe smoking. Right around that time, they were going to start closing off 12th Street. Uh, 12th Street ran from uh, college to Columbia. And there were many people in town who were upset that Hope wanted to consolidate this and, and make it much more uh, amenable for students, more, a lot safer, et cetera, going back and forth to buildings. People were worried that, of all things, that uh, fire apparatus, there was a fire station down by uh, Collin Park, would not be able to get to buildings on the east side of campus. There was a huge argument in city council. Two of the members, as I recall, were Hope faculty. And so there was, for a, a city that got along pretty well with its college, there was a lot of town gown uh, hostility at that time. And so that was a theory that this was arson, that it was people or a person really upset that the college had that much power to be able to close a major street in the downtown area and get away with this. My wife and I uh, used to often take a walk in the evening around the campus and, and uh, you soon start walking around and say, wouldn't it be great if 12th Street was closed? But there was a, a kind of a sense of we needed to take some real steps forward in the campus. And that's why I went to, had gone to City Hall and asked to close 12th Street. Closing streets uh, isn't... Uh, always popular with the city fathers. But so what the city council decided to do is to close it for one year with uh, just barricades at the end to see how it worked out. And at the end of that one year, uh, there has to be a public hearing so anybody could come. And I remember some students said to me, uh, they heard about that 
public hearing. We'd be glad to testify and how great it is for the campus to have 12th Street closed. So they did, and so when they finished, then a gentleman got up who, who lived uh, just east of the campus on one of those streets, 12th or 13th probably, probably 12th Street. And he got up and said, now you students, you've been here one year and uh, you'd like to close 12th Street. I've been here 35 years and I've been using 12th Street for 35 years and I don't like it to be closed. <laughs> so, but anyhow, that passed six to three. So that's the story of closing 12th Street. Approval was obtained and work was really just going to be getting underway on that project uh, when, this, uh, when this fire occurred. It uh, resulted uh, in some, some additional thinking on the part of the college and uh, as what we now know as Van Ralty, Van Ralty Commons, which is the, uh, the pedestrian walkway uh, on what used to be 12th Street, named in honor of uh, the founder of Holland and the founder of Hope College, who's uh, a building burned to the ground in April 1980. I was a student in the late 60s, early 70s, and it, the campus was so much smaller than, than, than people experience now. Um, like many fewer buildings, so Lubbers was a science building, there was a music building, the chapel, there were a lot of classes, both religion and other classes held in the basement of the chapel, so, you know, the, but the classroom space was much smaller. On the other hand, I think the student body was a little smaller too. And there were a lot of Hope faculty who lived quite close to campus, and much of that has, has changed now. Uh, I mean, even where, you know, Martha Miller is now in the Jack Miller, I mean, this is, uh, there was a, an elementary school there. Um, Hope is, and there was nothing over where, uh, I mean, the football field was the city football field, but all of the soccer, baseball areas, those are all totally new, the whole uh, basketball uh, stadium. Uh, the, the, there were houses over around, around where the, the library is. In fact, there was one gentleman, they finally convinced him to move out, but he wouldn't sell his house. And when he did, they could build the whole Van 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 project there. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's expanded, and, and I think in s some people in the city argue about this, but I think in many ways, you know, Hope has done a lot to preserve like neighborhoods like 14th and 15th Streets. Well, I think that the combination of that fire and the, and the opening of 12th Street to what is now Van Ralty Commons just really, you know, has created a, a, so much more of a, of a collegiate uh, campus feeling, you know, here, here at Hope. You know, it has blended our campus with uh, Western Theological Seminary. Uh, I don't have the, the traffic going right through the middle of campus on, like it used to when 12th Street was there. In a way, the campus looked a lot better after that building was gone. The Pine Grove was opened up, uh, the area seemed more spacious, so maybe after all, it was for the good. Uh, the Witt Center, which originally when it was built in 1978, it was, it was called the DeWitt Student and Cultural Center. Because of the fire, the decision had, was made to move the administration into DeWitt. So the student center portion uh, spaces devoted in that building uh, were, were taken over by, for offices for the administration. DeWitt had been a student space. There was a place to play pool and, and so on in the basement where the klutz now is. And there was a bowling alley off to the side where the bookstore is. Um, and of course it was an art museum up opposite the balcony in the theater. Uh, a lot of the space had to be condensed to make space for these offices. The, the room that had been a ballroom, I think, became a lot of offices as well. The old Colette's, much smaller, of course, than the Colette's that we have now. More for faculty lunch, but a very convivial place. 
professors loved to gather there, and they would have great discussions, apparently, and say, okay, what do you think? What do you think? And uh, apparently it was a lot of fun for them. It was a nice uh, space in the day for them to relax and talk to each other. So when we moved into the, you know, the cultural center with this big sort of antiseptic klutz, it was a big letdown. The one, the one thing that did, that did change because of the fire is that when, before the fire, the administration basically was all in, you know, in, one, in one building. And you know, as a result of the fire, the, the administration was kind of scattered scattered about campus and that has kind of continued a bit uh, to this to this day and age so maybe the closeness of administrator to administrator and function to function you know has changed uh, you know it was just wonderful experience when we were in Van Raleigh to be able to go downstairs to where the Kletz was and you know enjoy a cup of coffee you know with colleagues and that's a little more challenging now because the offices are scattered uh, you know with some on you know, some on eight, as far away as 8th Street uh, on a daily basis, you just don't uh, get together as much as, as, as we used to. So now we're, we've come all the way full circle. We're talking in the year of 2015-16, where plans to build a, a new uh, student center uh, are, on, are underway. I mean, I shouldn't say plans. The project is, is underway. And it's going to be a wonderful project. What's kind of cool about it is it's right in the heart of campus. Uh, when uh, you look out uh, from that new building, you're going to see the visages of the Pine Grove and Dimnit Memorial Chapel and, you know, really looking straight ahead where, where old Van Ralty uh, used to stand.